All right, well this video is the first part of chapter two. Chapter two is gonna be all about atoms. And once again, as we talked about before, atoms are the building blocks of all matter. They're the particles that all matter is made up of. So I've equated them before in the past to Legos, and it's still true, and I want you to, I just brought some Legos to kind of get us thinking about it here. So we know that all matter is made up of these building blocks, and they're combined in different ways to make molecules. Um, some small molecules, some really huge molecules, and all of matter just boils down to different combinations of atoms. Now the atoms are little, they're spheres, so they're not exactly like this. These are cubes, but they're spheres, all different sizes. But the idea is that um, each type of atom, and once again, the types of atoms are all listed on your periodic table. Each type of atom is slightly different. We're going to talk about the ways that they're different today, but the idea is that hydrogen atoms are different than oxygen atoms are different than fluorine atoms, for instance. So before we want to um, get into what the atoms look like and the different particles, we will be talking about protons, neutrons, and electrons today. Um, before we jump into that, though, we want to spend a little bit of time on talking about how do we know that matter is made up of atoms. The Chapter two also spends some time talking about that. So I want to also make sure we um, don't skip over that part, the history. So if you want to go ahead and just jot down your notes, the, the basic question, how do we know that matter is made up of these things called atoms? Because one thing that we, we can say is that it's not through direct observation. Atoms are too small to observe. So it's not the type of thing that you can just get a microscope and see, oh, there's the atoms. There they are. There, that, now we know. It, it was never like that, and it's still not like that. So there's other evidence that matter is made up of atoms besides just direct observation, which is, is not how we know. So really the way that this worked was, in history, over the last couple hundred years, there were three laws, three laws of nature that were discovered. Once again, laws are just um, um, patterns of behavior that matter seems to obey all the time in different, no matter what lab you're in, no matter what country you're in, matter seems to always obey various laws of nature. The three laws that we're going to talk about today, I'd like you to know their names. Um, I want you to know the person who discovered them and basically what they showed about matter. And then logically, we're going to bring that together and understand how that led to what we call atomic theory. So the first law, and these did come in order. So the first law was called the law of the conservation of mass. The law of the conservation of mass. And this law was discovered by Antoine Lavoisier, a Frenchman. I'm not going to need you to know the year. I'll tell you, um, you could jot it down because I did write it in my notes here. Late, 17, late 1770s, so around the time of the Revolutionary War was um, this discovery. So essentially, let me go ahead and tell you what he did. Uh, Antoine Lavoisier burned substances in closed containers. All right, so if you wanted to just illustrate what that was, it's fairly simple. You have a flask, and I'm making this a little bit obviously more simple than it really was, but the concept is simple. We have to make sure that these flasks are closed. So what we would put is, um, what he would have done is put a stopper and I don't know that he did this in flasks, but the idea is still the same. So the stopper allows, um, or it keeps anything from that was inside from coming out. That's what we mean by closed containers. So he's got substances, whatever it might be, in the closed container. And then he goes ahead and he burns them. So as you know... And like I said, I'm just, I'm taking a lot of liberty with how he did this experiment, but I'm just trying to show the idea of it. What we know is that when you burn something, it changes in character. When you have a fireplace, the wood, after it's burned, doesn't look like the same anymore. It looks like ashes. 
and it would have gotten really, really small and likely dark, okay? When you burn something, um, it becomes very dark. Now, why does it become so much smaller? What we now know, he didn't know it at the time, was that when you burn organic matter, much of that ends up being um, um, turned into gases. So a lot of that matter turns into gases that that would have occupied this space here. Now they're invisible to the eye. All that he would have seen was this part here, like the, the ashes. The gases would have been invisible, but that's why it was important for him to put that stopper on there so that the, none of the gases could escape. The main point of Lavoisier's experiment was that the mass of the reactants, in other words, everything that reacted in, the, in that container, which by the way was the material, but also the oxygen gas, because as we mentioned before in one of the earlier videos, to burn something you need oxygen. The mass of the reactants always equal the mass of the products. So even though the matter completely changed its character, its, uh, um, its uh, properties in terms of what it looked like, it always weighed the same before and after. The, the total um, matter inside those flasks. Now, what that really told Lavoisier was that matter is composed of something indestructible. Indestructible, unable to be destroyed. And actually, that's where these Legos are kind of a nice little analogy for atoms because um, they're pretty, you know, indestructible. Um, just like atoms, you, um, they don't just disappear, okay? You, they get, you know, recombined in different ways and to make different types of molecules when a reaction happens, but they don't just disappear into thin air. Um, they, they still exist. All right, so that was his main um, discovery. Let's move on to the second law which helped us understand that matter is made up of atoms. And the second law is called the law of definite proportions. Um, definite, we can also use the word fixed proportions. In other words, um, predictable, um, unchanging, that kind of thing. So let me get a little space here. Okay, so first of all, the person who discovered the, the law of definite proportions was J.J. Krauss. These are all very famous chemists in history, so I think it's kind of uh, important when you're taking an introductory chemistry course to, to learn some um, of the people who really helped make it happen. Okay, so what did J.J. Um, Proust do? J.J. Proust... Um, um, what he did was he examined um, compounds, and what I'll, for the explanation, I'll just use water. As we know, water is a compound. Water is made up of now. In this point, we you know where we are now, standing today, we can say that it's made up of H two O, two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. At the time, Krauss was not able to to know it in that way, because remember, this is all pre-understanding that matter is made up of atoms. So he's still looking at the water just as water, like in a flask at that level. What they did know at the time, what they did know is that water was made up of two elements. They knew that water contained both hydrogen and oxygen. At the time, they knew about the elements. They didn't know that they existed as atoms, but they knew that hydrogen, the element, was different than um, oxygen, and that they could combine to make these compounds such as water. What, um, what Proust did was he did some, he did some mathematical um, quantitative uh, experiments on elements, and what he found was, let me go ahead and just give you the finding. What he found was that um, every pure sample, so as long as it's pure water, every pure sample of a compound, no matter where he got it from, no matter how much he started with, always contains the same ratio
of one element to another. Whoops. By mass. I'm not going to go ahead and write the numbers on the board, but he basically said no matter where he got the water from, it was always an eight to one mass ratio of oxygen to hydrogen. No matter how he um, obtained that pure sample of water, no matter where in the world it came from, it was always this very fixed ratio of, um, in this case, oxygen to hydrogen by mass. So what that was a really important finding because what that revealed was that matter um, exists as some kind of units. These units we now call atoms, but they weren't quite ready for that word yet at the time, exists as units that combine in predictable or definite, I'm just going to write DEF for definite, proportions or ratios, whatever word you like, to make compounds. CMPDS is how I will um, abbreviate compounds. So in other words, there was, there was not a lot of mystery in it. There was predictability in it in terms of how the elements combine to make these compounds. Now, that's the second law. The third law is what really kind of sealed the deal in terms of understanding that matter is made up of atoms. The third law was called the law of multiple proportions. Sounds the same, sounds similar, I should say, as the previous one, but it's different. The previous one was the law of definite proportions. This is the law of multiple proportions. Okay, this one was discovered by John Dalton. And in terms of the year, we are now in 1808. So these laws kind of all came within a matter of um, 30 to 40 years. Um, the law of multiple proportions. This one here, I'm going to just jump straight to what was discovered because um, it takes a bit of time to show you all the evidence. You can read about it in your book. Um, but let me go ahead and just jump to what was discovered for the law of, de of multiple proportions. Um, what he discovered that one of these units, which we now call, now he is going to be the first person to formally call them atoms, now called atoms. So he's going to kind of bring it full circle and call them atoms. One unit is added to the compound at a time. Never a fraction of a unit. Okay, this is the part that really brought it full circle. In other words, what um, John Dalton discovered was that when, at, when these units are combined to make um, the compounds, you always add one at a time. So for instance, if this represents an additional hydrogen or whatever added to a compound, or added to a, in this case, we're just thinking about it as on the molecular level. You add one at a time. You don't add half a hydrogen or a quarter of a hydrogen or a smidgen of hydrogen. You don't just add just a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It's the building block concept, one at a time, okay? These, these are these um, fundamental building blocks. They themselves cannot be broken into smaller and smaller pieces. They get added as holes to the compound. That is the, is the, um, brought our understanding fully to this the concept of building blocks, that they're added as pieces not or as, as like whole units, not as a little, little bit of oxygen, a little smidgen. It wasn't like that whole um, units at a time. And he named them atoms. All right, so John Dalton is the one who really kind of brought this full circle. So those three laws, one, two, and three, um, I erased them, but you could just do something like this in your notes. Those three laws led to what's called atomic theory. Atomic theory. Atomic theory. Now, the word theory, I want you to, we haven't talked much about this here. Theories are different than laws. Theories explain, um, explain kind of what we call the backstory. Or the reason 
why the laws or why the the matter behaves as it does. And the idea about a theory is that um, a theory is because you're trying to explain something, you're trying to give a backstory. Theories are unseen. Okay, you're, de you're, you're dealing with things that you cannot see. We can't see these atoms. That's why we call it a theory. It's not like an observation. We're trying to explain why these laws exist with the best of our mental um, acuity being applied to it. So it's an unseen thing, which is why theories um, can be changed when new data, new experiments are brought to the attention of the scientific community. So theories are always under... Um, modification. And actually, atomic theory um, has four points. I'm going to list them on the board. Two of them turned out to be a little bit untrue, or at least um, had caveats to them. So this is a good example of how theories can be constantly changed when new laws are discovered or new experiments are done or whatever it might be. So let's go ahead and talk about atomic theory. First of all, it was John Dalton who published atomic theory. As soon as he um, discovered that law of multiple proportions, he laid out what's called atomic theory, which is the, the uh, accepted theory today for matter. We all um, are operating with this concept that matter is made up of atoms, and that's been working for the last 200 years, so I think it's a good one. So, all right, let's go ahead and lay out the postulates of atomic theory. First, each element, so each um, um, type of element, and remember there's hundreds, well, over a hundred different types of elements in the universe that have been discovered. An element is something that is, um, you can't break down into other types of, of things. So it's basically all the, all of these um, represent the different types of elements. All right, each element um, is composed of tiny, here we go, indestructible, remember Lavoisier's experiment, particles called atoms. Right, each element at its fundamental um, smallest point is composed of these atoms. Second point of atomic theory, um, all atoms of a given element have the same mass. Now this is one where upon learning more about atoms, we found out that this happens to be an untrue statement. So let me go ahead and write this. This turned out to be untrue because of what we're going to learn in just a few minutes, isotopes. So this postulate, even though it was presented by John Dalton and accepted by everyone at the time. Later, data came out when we had things like mass spectrometers and different things. We found out that this was an untrue statement. Not all atoms of the same element have the same mass because of isotopes. But still, it was part of the original um, atomic theory presentation. Third, atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to make compounds. All right, so what we mean by that is that, um, just using an example, CO2. Okay, so um, this is a compound, and to get this compound, you'll have one carbon for every two oxygen atoms. What you will never see is something like this. You can never have a fraction, like I just wrote 2.3. You can never have a fraction of an element in a compound. Something like, you know, you can never have H0.5, you know, O, something like that. You can never have a fraction. All of the subscripts have to be whole numbers. And that's what that's um, trying to say there. All right. And then the fourth postulate or the fourth part of atomic theory 
atoms of one element cannot change delta for change into atoms of another element. Once you have, um, if you have a carbon atom, it doesn't just magically turn into a hydrogen atom or a chlorine atom just doesn't magically turn into a fluorine atom. It will stay. Now it will get recombined into other um, molecules if you can break the bonds that you originally had and put it with some new atoms to make new bonds, but it doesn't just magically turn into another element. Now here's the rub though. There is a caveat to that. So let me go ahead and write the word caveat. There is an exception. This is generally true that atoms of one element don't just change into another, but the caveat is this. Um, what we call radioactive decay or radioactive radioactivity, radioactive decay. That says radioactive decay. In the Chem 102, you will learn about um, nuclear chemistry. And it is true that if an atom is what we call radioactive, like uranium is a radioactive atom, those can decay and become different types of atoms, and they do. Uranium will become lead, for instance. Um, however, just to kind of put you at ease here, most of your radioactive atoms whoops, are lower on the periodic table. And if you look for uranium, you're going to find it pretty low um, right there. And what you will soon no notice is that, oops, I'm trying to get this straight, is that much of our focus in this course deals with the top parts of the periodic table. So you're not going to deal a lot with radioactive decay in this course. In fact, I don't think ever. But um, in Chem 102, you will, and it's a very, very interesting part of science, obviously very important from understanding nuclear energy to um, nuclear weapons and, um, you know, radiation treatments for cancer. It's a very important part of chemistry, but not for this course. Chem 102 is where you'll start to learn more about that. Um, anyhow. This last statement only only partly true because of the caveat. Okay, so that's atomic theory. And at this point in 2020, it is the um, accepted theory as far as what matter is made up of. And I don't expect it to change, but you know, all theories can be modified slightly and they, they are all the time. So now that we have established that matter is made up of atoms, let's get into the structure of an atom. This is the part that a lot of people will already have been familiar with parts of it. What's inside the atom? What are the parts of an atom? What's the geography of the atom in terms of the nucleus and all that different things? So let's go ahead and label this next part the structure of an atom. What does an atom look like? What's inside of it? We already talked about the fact that they are spherical. Okay, they are. But what is inside of the atom? Um, let me go ahead and just do write this key point. At the end of the day, atoms are extremely simple in what they are. Atoms are simply a collection or if we want to, maybe even a better word, a conglomeration. Okay, collection where they're all kind of together in, in space. Of three subatomic, meaning smaller than atoms, three subatomic particles. Okay, and at the end of the day, you know what they are. They are the protons. And then we'll just abbreviate that with a little p. Neutrons, and we'll abbreviate that with a little n. And electrons. And electrons, let's go with little e, but let's put a little minus on there because, um, first of all, that's how I always do it. But even in different parts of chemistry, you'll actually include electrons in your equations and you'll be writing little little negative signs with them. So E, e minus for electrons, just as a shorthand. 
Um, the different types of atoms. What makes one atom different from the next is just different numbers of each particle. Okay, so you're changing the numbers of particles. Um, so that fundamentally is what makes hydrogen different than lithium. Okay, is different numbers of each type of particles. So at the end of the day, you're just having these three different types of particles and adding, you know, um, a certain amount of protons and electrons will give you one type of atom. A certain number of protons and neutrons and electrons will give you another type of atom. So that's really how what makes one atom different than the other is the numbers of each of these that gets incorporated into your atom. All right, what we're going to do is take um, each of these at a time and learn a little bit about them. Let's start with electrons. Um, once again, E minus for electrons. Let's give you a few things that you know need to know about electrons. The first thing that we should just mention is that electrons were discovered first. And electrons were discovered by J.J. Thompson. We're gonna, that's going to end up being important when we learn about the plum pudding model and the famous gold foil experiment, which we'll do later. But for now, let's just jot that on the board that electrons were discovered first. Secondly, electrons have a negative charge. Now, we're going to stop right there because one of the things about my teaching style and the way I approach chemistry is that I don't like anything to be unknown. I hate the feeling of like, okay, charge, and then we move on. I like to stay, stop at that and let's say, what are we talking about? What in the world are you meaning negative charge? So let's take a minute, take a little uh, step aside and say, what is electrical charge? Okay, so I'm gonna do like what we call an aside. It's a little box. What is electrical charge? Obviously, it's important. If electrons have a negative charge, it's important. It is important to chemistry. It's hugely important. It drives pretty much all of chemistry. But what is it? So let's talk about that. Electrical charge is a fundamental property or characteristic of some subatomic particles and what you probably already know is that we're talking about protons and electrons okay these are the two subatomic particles that actually have this property of electrical charge and that electrical charge results in either attractive or repulsive um, let me leave a little space I'm going to draw a little picture forces with other charged particles So let's flesh this out just a little bit here. First of all, electrical charge is a fundamental pro property. It is not something that the electron owns. It's not a commodity. It's be because it cannot be gained or lost. The electron does not pick up a negative charge and give it away. It just is negatively charged, okay? So it's, it's a property of something, like I am a human being. It, I'm not talking about something like my ring that I can take on or off, okay? It's, it's more um, innate than that. Electrons just are negative, negatively charged. Secondly, you know charge by the, the forces that result when you're with another charged particle. So you, you know it from the result of it. There's really only two um, options. You either are going to have attractive forces, and you know this already. Um, positive, that's a positive sign, and negative charges will attract. Opposite charges attract, okay? So if you have opposite 
physically charged particles, they will come together. They will be brought together. They will, they will physically move towards each other. Repulsive would be either one of two things. Either you have a positive and a positive particle. They are going to repel. Repulsive means they're going to move away from each other. If they're the same charge, positive and positive, they will repel. They will want to move away. And the same is true for if you have a negative and a negatively charged particle. They will also repel. So like charges repel. And so that's what electrical charge is. It's, um, it's known by how it manifests when you're with other charged particles. Now, a very important word. Well, this is a very easy concept. In fact, most people already know it before they come to this course. But what they might not know is this word. These forces, the attractive or repulsive forces, are called electrostatic forces. You are going to see that term all over your textbook. And I'm going to use it a lot, especially as we move um, farther into understanding bonding, electrostatic forces. But understand that this term, it, when you see the term, just think about this picture and this picture, because that's all that it is. Attract, attraction of like charge, or sorry, attraction of opposite charges or repulsion of like charges. That's all that that is. All right, so we've got that electrical charge is a property that some particles have, both um, protons and electrons. Let me give you one other thing about electrical charge. Electrical charge can be measured. It can be measured just like you can measure something's mass, you can measure something's length, you can measure something's volume, you can measure something's electrical charge. And the unit is the coulombs in coulombs. That's the unit of electrical charge, coulombs. Okay, so now that we have that a little bit about what electrical charge is, let me give you the, the um, electrical charge in coulombs of one electron. Um, electrons, they have a negative charge. Let me give you um, the exact number. I have it written down. I don't have it memorized. And I'll explain why I don't have it memorized in just a minute. Uh, let's see here. Here it is. Negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. It's a very small number. 10 to the negative 19th means you've moved this decimal place over 19 spaces. So we're ridiculously small in terms of the number. But you'll notice it is a negative number. That's a negative charge. Leave that there for now. We will return to that in your notes. Um, actually, you know what? Since I'm not going to have it, um, no, it'll be fine. Yeah, we'll return to it in a minute. So it has a negative charge. And now let's go ahead and give you the mass of an electron. Electrons have a very small mass, which is not surprising. You're talking about a subatomic particle, and atoms are tiny. So obviously, it has a very small mass. But really, even in comparison, comparison to protons and neutrons, electrons are tiny. They're the smallest by far of the subatomic particles. Let me give you the mass in kilograms. It's very small. But I want you to see a couple things. So 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. Jot that down. You're not going to need to memorize that number. But also, let me have you write this down for now. Or 0 0.00055 AMU. AMU is a different type of unit. Obviously, you know kg is kilograms. That's the, the SI unit for mass. AMU stands for Atomic Mass Unit. And it's a unit that um, was invented to deal with very small particles like atoms. We will teach that later. For now, just jot it in your notes, okay? I will talk about it later because it, it's really not the best time to talk about it now. We, a better time will be later. So we'll leave that alone. And then, um, but just understand that this, the tininess of this number. Although we will have you jot something down in a little bit when I give you the protons mass. So just leave a little space there. 
Um, electrons. Um, last thing about electrons, these occupy, and when I say occupy, I'm just basically telling you where they live. They live in the space around the nucleus. Okay, so we will talk about the nucleus a little bit in, the, in a second, but the nucleus is the center of the atom. So if the atom is a sphere, the nucleus is in the center. The electrons don't live there. They don't live in the nucleus. They live in the space around the nucleus. And we'll draw a little picture when we get some more things to jot in our notes. One thing I do want you to know is that this space around the nucleus has a couple different names, all of which are fine. Um, one is just a nice, smart sounding word called the extra nuclear space. Extra meaning outside, like if you are extraordinary, extraordinary, you're outside the ordinary. So extra nuclear means outside the nucleus. Extra nuclear space or um, the electron cloud. That's another word that people will use for that space around the nucleus. Or um, what we are going to learn later in the course, the orbitals. All of that, honestly, is the same space. It's the same, talking about the exact same thing. So different words meaning all the same thing, the space around the nucleus. So that's enough to say about electrons for now. Let's go ahead and move on to protons. Protons. So protons we'll, we'll use for a little key. Um, what we want to say about protons first is that protons have a positive charge. So protons have a positive charge. The opposite charge of the electron is, is um, the protons. They have a positive charge. But let's look at the number for a moment here. So I want to um, give you the exact number. Remember, charge is something that can be measured. So each proton, each proton will have a positive um, 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. What I want you to notice is that that number, peek back at what the number I gave you for the electrons, this number is the exact same size, so the exact same magnitude, that's the fancy word for size. The number is the same size. The difference is the, is the sign. For protons, it's a positive 1.60. For the electrons, it's a negative 1.60. And because the, um, the, the amount of charge is the exact same for protons and electrons, it's just the, the, the charge is different. Scientists have decided a long time ago that we were not going to deal, when, when kind of thinking about um, just everyday chemistry, when doing, you know, doing um, ions and just looking at everyday chemistry, we don't really care that much about the size and coulombs of the charge. What scientists do is they just say, I'm just going to write the word or. They just say that each proton they're going to call a plus one charge. So I just that just says, I know that's light, but it says or plus one. We're not going to measure it in coulombs per se or talk about it in coulombs. We're just going to say that the protons are each a plus one charge. And if you want to flip back to your notes on the electrons, go ahead and add that in under where the electrons charge was. And instead of thinking about in coulombs, you're really just for an electron going to write negative one. So for an electron, you're just going to write negative one for each electron. So let's just think about that for a minute. Say you have, and I'm just going to be real, um, really just kind of, let me get a darker red marker. If you have two protons, so that's what I'll use for protons for a moment. Oh, that's not red. Kind of get a different color. Well, I'll just use black. If you have two protons, and say you have three electrons, I'm not, I'm not even going to do the, the spacing correctly. I just want you to see here. If you have two protons, but three electrons, that means you have two positive charges and three negative charges. So overall, that will give you a negative one charge. 
There's different ways to think about that. Some people think about it very mathematically and they just add up all the numbers. So if you add positive two to negative three, I mean, if you're, some people are not too math minded, so you could certainly use your calculator. Do plus two, whoops, plus two plus, whoops, why does my calculator keep doing that? Well, I guess you would have to just do two because I'm doing plus and it's whatever. Just do two, that means plus two, plus negative three. By the way, calculators have a negative button there at the bottom, right there. Um, you'll get negative one for an answer, at least you should. I'm trying to do this with one hand and I'm pressing all sorts of wrong buttons. Two plus negative three. Why is it giving me a... Anyhow, you know that. Two plus negative three is negative one. Um, some other people, actually how I usually think about it is like just what one neutralizes the other one. So I usually think about, okay, this will kind of neutralize or cancel out this one. A positive and a negative will cancel each other out. This positive will cancel out this negative, and that'll leave you a negative one charge. That's usually my mind, how my mind thinks about it. All right, we'll get to counting numbers and the implications of that later when we do um, ions, but just wanted to mention that real quick. All right, so the, another thing we want to learn about protons is their mass. So let me go ahead and give you the mass. Um, a proton, protons have a mass of, let me give you the number, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So as you'll notice, the number is really small. Of course, it's really small. It's a subatomic particle. It's not going away a lot. However, if you look at that number compared to the mass of an electron, go ahead and peek back at your notes. Which number is larger? Let you take a second and peek back. Which number is larger, the proton or the electron? And hopefully you see that the proton is actually larger because this number is smaller. It's going to have you move fewer spaces to the left. So it's actually a, it's actually a larger number than the other one. Um, what I want you to do is do a little experiment with me, math experiment. Let's figure out how many times larger the proton is than the electron. So what we're going to do is take this number, the bigger one, and divide it by the mass of the electron. So go ahead and in your calculator, um, any time that you are doing scientific notation into your calculator, it's a good idea to enclose it in parentheses. So I just use my parentheses. And I'm going to enter 1.67. Now, let me show you something real quick here. I've got 1. Can you see that? It's kind of a glare. Ah, 1.67. Instead of timesing 10 to that over here, like don't press times 10. I don't usually do that. I use what's called this function here. If you do second log, you will get the 10 to the function. Notice I never even press the time sign. 1.67, it does times 10 to the right there, 10 to the negative 27th, close parentheses, and then I press enter. I let my calculator read the entry. Oh, for Pete's sake, I'm struggling. Hold on. This calculator is doing something a little strange. Let me grab the other one. I was doing that before, too. I don't know if I have a weird thing. Let me try that again. 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27th, enter. Okay, that is my... My calculator is accepting the entry. Now I'm going to divide by the mass of the electron. So go back, grab that number, and I put it in parentheses. I put um, I have answer divided by, uh, here's another parentheses. Now I gotta look up that mass of the electron real quick. It was 9.1, and again, times 10 to the, I use the second log function times 10 to the negative 31, close the parentheses. Okay, you gotta close the parentheses to that part, but then you have to close the parentheses to the whole thing. And then I'm getting a number 1835, so around 2000. So really what we just discovered is that this is about 2000 times more massive than an electron. So it was 1800 or something like that. So about 2000 times more massive. That's why 
when we're thinking about the mass of an atom, you can pretty much ignore the electrons. The electrons are so tiny that they're like negligible. Really, the protons have so much more mass than the electrons. And we're going to learn also, so do the neutrons, but we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so they have a fairly big mass compared to the electrons. Third bullet point about protons. Protons are, oh, you know what, real quick, let me give you this. They have a mass of this many kilograms, or, let me give you one more thing, or about, that means about, one atomic mass unit. We will talk about that, as I said later, but jot it down in your notes now. A proton is about one atomic mass unit. Um, all right, and then moving on to where the protons live. Protons um, are found in the nucleus of an atom. Protons are found in the nucleus of an atom. Okay, so that's enough to say about protons. Although actually, you know what? Let me take a little second here and just mention how we know that they live in the nucleus. I'm gonna show you the picture from the textbook. I don't want you to miss over such an important um, figure in the textbook. So let me just grab, this is just a little aside and I'm just gonna talk you through it. Yeah, it's on page, it's on section 2.5 in chapter two, but as you're doing your readings, don't skip over this part. This is such an important part of chemistry here. What you're looking at here is called the plum pudding model. The plum pudding model. It's, it's a model of the atom that, um, that we used to have. So um, I don't know how many years ago it was, over 100 years ago, um, J.J. Thompson, presented this picture as maybe what a what an atom would look like. And the plum pudding model, what he, remember the first subatomic particle to be discovered was the electron. I had you write that in your notes. And they knew that they had negative charge. So J.J. Thompson said, well, maybe the electrons live in this very kind of interspersed way. They're the little, little yellow circles. Maybe they live in this very interspersed way in the um, atom. He had no reason to think that they wouldn't. So actually, let, let me have you just uh, jot a few notes down in your um, notes. The plum pudding model. Like I said, this is J.J. Thompson, very famous. Um, so he, his belief was that the electrons just lived in this very kind of interspersed way, um, almost like a blueberry muffin where they're the blueberries. And what he believed at the time was, see, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, but you need to understand for this, is that it was known that atoms are overall neutral. And actually, I'm writing that in green, but I don't want you to underestimate how important that is. That is actually true. Atoms are neutral, and frankly, all matter is neutral. If it's not neutral, it becomes neutral very quickly. Think about lightning and think about static electricity, but like matter is neutral. Like I'm neutral, this is neutral. Overall, everything is neutral and so are atoms. So J.J. Thompson said, well, if the electrons are negative, there must be positive charge to like counterbalance it. And what he believed was that all the positive charge was in the rest of the atom smeared, like diffused out. So positive charge, And actually, all the mass, because he knew that the electrons weren't very massive. So he believed that the positive charge in the mass was spread out over the atom. That was the plum pudding model. Kind of like diffuse, the, like the, the muffin part of a blueberry muffin. The, the um, I, I think it maybe was his graduate student, but Ernst Rutherford, who is who worked for him, was trying to actually prove this model. And he did a really cool experiment called the, the gold foil experiment. Let me see if I can just explain this here. He had a piece of gold foil, which is essentially, think, think aluminum foil, but instead of aluminum atoms, gold atoms, okay? So each, so this foil is just a, billions of gold atoms. And what he does in the experiment, it's a really neat experiment, 
he has a source of radioactivity or radioactive particles. These particles that he's shooting, it's literally like a shooting um, at the atom, are huge positive particles, okay? They're called alpha particles. But picture like these bullets, they're like basically bullets. These, they're called alpha particles. They're these very large positive bullets, okay? Particles that he's shooting. They're a type of radioact radioactive particle. He's shooting them through the gold foil. And he's expecting them, let me back up to, I'm actually going to show this picture here. He's expecting them to be able to go through the atoms perfectly without any kind of barrier. Because remember, he believes that the positive charge, the red part of the atom is all diffused, spread around like peanut butter. So that if there's, so that if you're shooting a positive particle, it can just be able to go straight through because there's nothing really concentrated po positive to bounce it back. So anything that's positive is just smeared all around. So he thinks they're going to go straight through. What he found, backing up to this one experiment here, is that some of them did go through, but many of them got deflected, and some of them even bounced straight backwards. So that was the key finding in Ernst Rutherford's gold foil experiment, was that when he shot these alpha particles into the atom, instead of just being able to pass through because there was nothing impeding them, some of them like ricocheted back on and, and just, he was able to capture it on film. The discovery there was that there's something in the atom, a geography in the atom, which we now call the nucleus, where, oops, that's gone, where all the positive charge lives. And when that alpha particle, if it happened to hit that nucleus, that's what made it ricochet back. All the positive charge lives in the center. So essentially, Rutherford discovered the nucleus. In this experiment through the, through the gold foil experiment, gold foil experiment. Now, I didn't give you very many things to write in your notes, but maybe I would challenge you, leave a little space in your notes and see if you could write yourself a paragraph describing that experiment. After you do your readings or maybe you watch that video or rewind it, watch it again. It's very simple, the experiment. It's all about those alpha particles bouncing back. So they must have hit something that repelled them. Remember, positive things repel other positive things. And that's why it came back. It wasn't able to pass through something so positive. Really neat experiment, but it, that's what discovered the nucleus. So when I say protons live in the nucleus, that's why we know that they live in the nucleus. Okay. Now let's move on to the last subatomic particle, the neutron. Neutrons. Neutrons we will use as a capital, or sorry, the lowercase n. Neutrons. Um, as you might expect, because if you look at the first five letters, N-E-U-T-R, um, hopefully will make you realize that neutrons have a neutral meaning zero charge. Neutrons do not have a charge, okay? So they are not a charged particle. They are neutral. Let's also say that um, neutrons have a mass um, about the same as um, a proton. So it's ever so slightly different, but it's not enough to worry about. The reasons are even kind of very um, quantum mechanically confusing too, the reasons they're slightly different. So don't worry about that. We're going to think of them as the, having pretty much the exact same mass, okay? And go ahead and say that they also weigh about one atomic mass unit. Um, I'm not even going to bother giving to what they are in kilograms. It's not necessary. They pretty much weigh the exact same as a proton, one atomic mass unit. And neutrons also live in the 
the nucleus of the atom. Now, I think I went through chemistry for years before asking just such an obvious fundamental question because we don't talk that much about neutrons in the class. Protons and electrons get a lot of attention, neutrons not so much. What's the point of a neutron? Why are they there? If they don't have a charge, what are they doing? And the answer is fascinating. So let me go ahead and at least give you just a tiny bit on what neutrons do. Neutrons function is to hold the nucleus together. And they act like a glue. Another way that we could say hold the nucleus together, you could say they stabilize the nucleus. Just like if you add glue to a piece of furniture, you're stabilizing the furniture. Okay, so that's kind of what neutrons do. Now, let's back up a minute and be like, okay, fine, but why? Well, let me go ahead and um, draw a little picture for you and help you, help you see this. Maybe you already see it, but I think it probably took me years to see this for some reason. I don't know really why. It was like a missing hole in my understanding for way too long. If you have an atom, I'm just going to do a generic atom, okay? Um, let me just do a, a generic sphere. There's no membrane to an atom, okay? It's just, it's just a spherical shape. Let me make that a little bit nicer. We already know there's a nucleus right in the center. And by the way, the nucleus is extremely small. In terms of size, it's literally like this big in terms of size. Now, I'm not going to be able to draw it that small because I have to draw some things inside, but it is tiny. The vast majority of the space of an atom is the electron cloud. Let's just say this atom has three protons, okay? So three positive charges. One positive charge, another positive. Like these are particles, right? They're particles, but they have a positive charge. Say this atom has three protons, three protons. And in just a little bit, um, I will explain to you that this is lithium, okay? It must have, it must be lithium if it has three protons. We'll get to that in just a minute. But anyhow, um, what do we know? Oh, and by the way, let's just draw a couple of electrons in the electron cloud. I'll just draw three of them. Okay. But the point here is the neutrons. If the protons are positive, what do we know they should be experiencing? Well, they should be trying to repel each other. Positive charges do not want to be near positive charges. So there is a repulsive electrostatic force happening in that nucleus. They want to not be there with the other protons. That's not good for them to be near each other. So they want to be, they want to be far away from each other. The point of the neutrons, and there are neutrons in a, in a lithium nucleus. I'm just going to draw these as empty circles. I'm just going to draw four of them, okay? Don't worry about the numbers for now. The point of the neutrons is this. Neutrons, um, actually any particle with mass will, will experience what's called a strong force with other particles that have mass, kind of like a gravity, where they, where they pull each other towards each other just because they both have mass. The neutrons will actually provide that strong force in the nucleus, and they will kind of bring everybody together because of this other physics force called the strong force. That force will be bigger than the repulsive force trying to get the protons away from each other, and that will stabilize the nucleus. Um, when you learn more about nuclear chemistry, the numbers of neutrons is really important. If you change that, sometimes that will destabilize the atom and make it decay and make it emit radioactivity and all that other stuff. But for now, just understand that they are, they are basically providing a strong force that keeps that nucleus together like a glue. And that is their main function. All right, so let's go ahead and put all of this together and start drawing some atoms. And I want to um, go ahead and get your eyes on a periodic table. I'm going to teach a couple new things here. So I've got a periodic table. You can either use that or the, you can use the one in your textbook. Okay, let's go ahead and draw. Um, let's go ahead and draw a helium atom. Okay. B 
being able to picture atoms and being able to kind of um, understand the different parts of the atoms and how many of each there are is essential. You can't really progress in chemistry unless you've got this mental picture in your mind where you can just picture what helium looks like. And that's really what we're gonna be getting at here. The first thing is that your periodic table has some very important information on it. All periodic tables have very important information on it. So what you need to do is find helium, okay? And that square containing helium, I'm gonna jot it on the board. Now, if you go to the internet um, and try to get a periodic table, you will see that they're not all the exact same. I mean, the order of the elements is the same, but some of them have like the whole number, so helium is two. Some of them have that on the bottom, not on the top. Some of them have more decimal places in this bottom number, um, maybe sometimes like five or six decimal places. So because of that, and not that any of them are wrong, but because of that, I really want you to always use the periodic table that is on Blackboard under course documents or um, the one that's in the front of your textbook. They actually have the exact same numbers. Okay, so you'll see helium over here, 2 and 4.003. Um, I don't want us to be using different periodic tables. It's going to, it's, um, it makes things complicated for no reason, okay? So I want us to always have the same numbers and always have the same format. So use one of the periodic tables, either the book one or the one on Blackboard. Okay, so that's helium, obviously, and that's, you know, we want to make sure we memorize that chemical symbol. That means helium. That is the one that you put in balloons and make them rise and all that stuff. These two numbers, let's talk about what they are. This number here is the atomic number the atomic number very important to just know that by heart the atomic number what is that number telling you about helium it's so basic but it's so important the atomic number is telling you the number of protons in a helium atom and that's really what it's telling you. That's really it. That's all that it's telling you is the number of protons in a helium atom is two. Doesn't tell you the electrons, doesn't tell you the neutrons, it's the number of protons. And right off the bat, you'll gain something really important about chemistry, is that what makes one atom different than another? Remember when I was talking about these um, Legos, I said, okay, each type of atom is different, okay? The fundamental difference, the biggest, most basic difference between one atom and the next is the number of protons, because you'll notice they each have a different number. Hydrogen is the atom that has one proton. And if you have one proton, you are hydrogen. Helium has two protons. Lithium has three protons. And that's why earlier when I drew an atom with three, I said, oh, by the way, that's lithium, because it is. If I asked you, can you tell me the name of the atom that has 17 protons? the name of the atom that has 17 protons. You should be able to do that by locating atomic number 17 and finding that it's chlorine. If I asked you how many protons does calcium have, you should be able to find calcium. You've memorized his symbol is capital C, lowercase a, and you will see that he has 20 protons. All right, so fundamentally, that's what makes one atom different than the next. That's why calcium and chlorine are different. Fundamentally, it's because the number of protons. They have other differences as well, but at the very basic level, it's the protons that define the element. All right, and that's given in the atomic number. So if I want to draw a helium atom, let me go ahead and just draw a spherical kind of outline. Because at the end of the day, the, uh, the shape will be spherical. Um, but like I said, that's not a real thing. That's just the shape of it. It's, there's no membrane. It's not like a cell, okay? Um, in the nucleus, there must be two protons if it's helium. So one, and I, I'm just doing a plus sign because as you remember, each proton has a positive one charge. Okay, so plus sign for each proton. Now, um, let me go ahead and give you this. I, I mentioned it earlier, but let me put it again in your notes. It's that important. All atoms, 
are neutral. Neutral meaning zero overall charge. All atoms, if you use the term atoms, then you are implying that it is the neutral par uh, particle of that atom. If not, if it's not neutral, you use the term ion. And we will talk about ions later, but for now, just understand when you use the term atom, you're talking about the neutral form. If it wasn't neutral, you'd be calling it an ion. So that tells you another thing. It tells you the number of electrons, because if I'm drawing a helium atom, it must be neutral. And if I have two positive charges in my nucleus, I must have two negative charges or two electrons floating around my electron cloud. And they, for now, will put them anywhere. We will learn about orbitals in this course later in the semester, come chapter um, eight or nine or something like that. I can't remember. But anyways, that where they live, just put them outside the nucleus. Now let's come over to the, um, the last thing we have to do is add the neutrons. And that's gonna be what this number is for here. So talked about the atomic number, that's the number of protons. This number here is called the atomic mass. The atomic mass. Now, um, it's also called the molar mass, and we will learn that part later. It has two words. It's, it's depending on kind of what context you're thinking about, um, you either call this the atomic mass or the molar mass. Because I'm not wanting to go there yet, I don't really want to talk about moles and molar mass yet, leave that alone for now. We will get to that in chapter three, I believe. For now, we're just going to think about it as the atomic mass. Now, what does atomic mass mean? Well, it's the mass of an atom, the mass of an atom. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because of something called isotopes. Let me leave that alone for a minute and let me just give you one thing to write in your notes. The atomic mass is the mass of an average helium atom when you consider isotopes. All right. I don't think it's right to totally throw in with that yet and go into isotopes yet. We'll do it very soon. For now, just think of it, it's the mass of like an average helium atom, like your typical, you could use the word typical. It's the mass of a typical helium atom. For now, all I want you to do, because it takes some time to develop what I, you know, what it really is, and we're not really for, ready for it yet. Um, oh, by the way, it's in atomic mass units in atomic mass units, in AMUs. For now, if you could just round the number with me. Okay, that's gonna be good enough for now. So this number is around four AMUs. Okay, so because it's, it's gonna, you'll notice that at least for the smaller atoms, they're, they're usually very close to a whole number. Helium, I mean, um, hydrogen's around one, helium's around four, lithium's around seven, beryllium's around nine. Just round it with me for now, and just for this part here. So it's about four atomic mass units, which means the, the uh, helium, an average typical helium atom weighs four atomic mass units. Now, where does that mass come from? Remember, the electrons are negligible. They're not helping you achieve that mass. Each of those protons weighs about one atomic mass unit. So he weighs one. This is a second atomic mass unit. So what that's telling you is, is that this helium atom must have two neutrons because here's your third atomic mass unit. Because remember, they also weigh about one atomic mass unit. And here's your fourth. That's how you're going to get a total mass of four AMUs. And essentially, you're looking at a helium atom. Literally, there's nothing more to it than that. It's a conglomeration of protons, neutrons, and electrons in various numbers. Let's go ahead and do just one more just to get the point let's go ahead and draw a beryllium atom a beryllium atom so you want to um, you'll notice that I already have the symbol for beryllium memorized you need to get there because on a test I might write the word beryllium 
and you'll have to be able to go to your periodic table and find it. All the names are listed on your front cover on this page, but it's going to take way too much time for you to be looking up those, not, those symbols. Um, the chemistry is going to get much harder than what we're doing here, so we're just laying the groundwork. For early in that, and let's find the box. Let's see what the numbers look like here. The atomic number of beryllium, four. The atomic mass of beryllium, 9.012, which is telling you that a typical beryllium atom weighs or has a mass of about nine AMUs. That's about how much it weighs. So see if you can either pause the video and, or just look down and start drawing a beryllium atom. All the different parts, protons, neutrons, electrons. So you're going to want to put four protons in the nucleus. There will be four electrons in the electron cloud because if it's an atom, it must be electrically neutral. Another way of thinking about it, if it's neutral, there have to be equal numbers of protons and electrons. That's how you would get an overall zero charge. Positive four and negative four add up to zero. And neutrons, how many? Well, if the whole thing weighs about nine atomic mass units, the protons are going to give us four atomic mass units. Therefore, we need five neutrons to make up the rest of that mass. And that is a typical beryllium atom. All right, so let's see here. Let's go ahead and progress a bit farther and deal with this concept of isotopes. I'm trying to find the... Uh, an appropriate place to stop here, but I think I want to keep going a little bit farther, making sure I'm saying everything. Yeah, let's go ahead and push ourselves a bit farther into isotopes, and then we'll complete the video um, with isotopes. All right. All right, isotopes. So, isotopes are atoms of the same element that have different numbers of neutrons. See, they have to have the same number of protons or else they wouldn't be the same element. But um, within the same element, there can be like subtypes of the atom, and those are called isotopes. They can have different numbers of neutrons. The best way for me to explain this is to give an example and look at some and draw some pictures together. It's just by far the best way to learn about isotopes because um, it's actually a very easy concept once you can just see it. So let me go ahead and, as an example, carbon has three isotopes. Let me stop right there for a minute here. How do I know carbon has three isotopes? I just know that because I've been teaching it for a long time, and I've looked it up. Okay. There's nothing about carbon, when you look at it on the periodic table, there it is, number six, um, where you're going to find that information, okay? So you can't kind of find on the information how many isotopes, or you can't find on the periodic table how many isotopes there are of an element. That information does not exist on your periodic table. So I don't expect you to know that by heart, but for my, for my explanation, that's going to be important. But like, for instance, I can't just, it wouldn't be fair for me to ask you how many isotopes does magnesium have. I would have to look that up. That information is not listed on your periodic table, wherever magnesium is. It's not listed there. So how many types of isotopes it has, it just has to be provided to you. But carbon does have three isotopes, three types of carbon atoms. And let me go ahead and tell you what they are. And we're going to draw them. 
Um, the first isotope is called C12. The second isotope is called C13. And the last one is called C14. So these are the three types of carbon atoms or the three isotopes of carbon. Let's go ahead and draw them. Um, I have a couple numbers. I might, yeah, here it is right here. Okay, let's go ahead and draw them um, just like we did helium and beryllium. Okay, so C12. Got a sphere here. Um, how many protons should we put in this carbon isotope? Well, remember, carbon will always have six protons because carbon's atomic number is six. That's what your periodic table is going to tell you, the atomic number, six. So as soon as I know I'm dealing with carbon, which is the capital C here, carbon, I know it must have six protons. That is um, non-negotiable. Got to have six protons. No other, no other choice, or else it wouldn't be carbon. Um, how many electrons does it have? Well, we're not dealing with ions. No one ever said anything about ions. So therefore, it must have six electrons. I'm looking for other colors here. Yeah, it must have six electrons. So let me go ahead and draw the six electrons. Let's see if this works. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, now that leads us to the neutrons. And that is, a, we have a new vocabulary word here. When you see an element dash number, okay, you only see it sometimes, but when you see it, element dash number, you are looking at a specific isotope of that element, and that number is called the mass number. Oops, that's not a good one. Let me use black. This number is called the mass number. You have to be careful because we've had atomic number, atomic mass, and now we have mass number. But you can't mix and match those words. It's actually very important that you keep them clear in your mind. That's why note taking is so helpful because you writing it is sealing it in your mind. That is the mass number of this isotope. And what a mass number is, is very simple. It's just the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if the number is 12, we know carbon has six protons. If the mass number is 12, that implies, just use a little bit of deduction, that you must also have six neutrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. He must have six neutrons for you to have a mass number of 12, because that's the total number. That's not a, there's not a unit to it. You're literally counting particles. It's really essentially how many particles you have in your nucleus. So that's C12. Let's draw C13. Well, they have a lot in common. They both have six protons. Because they're both carbon. They both have six electrons. Because they're both neutral atoms. But this one will have how many neutrons? His mass number is 13. So he will have seven neutrons, three, four, five, six, seven in his nucleus. He's actually slightly heavier than that isotope there, the C12. Let's move on to C14. So really what we're, we're getting at is that in the universe, in the world of carbons, wherever carbon is, there's three different types of carbon atoms. Um, and really, there, there's some things that are the same, and, a few, and the number of neutrons is really the only difference. All right, C14, six protons. Six electrons. How many neutrons? Hopefully you're drawing eight neutrons. Because that's the only way that you would have a mass number of, of 14 for that particular isotope. Now, a couple more things to say about these um, isotopes. The first is 
This is one way to describe the isotope. Very common way is to just to do the element dash mass number. But there is really another way that's frankly just as common, 50-50, okay? And that's to write it like this, is to have the element symbol with the atomic number there and the mass number up there. So this is another way to write it, where you have the element symbol, mass number, top left, atomic number, bottom left. So can you go ahead and write the other two? Just It's just designations. It's ways to describe an isotope. So this is one way to describe him. This is the other way to describe him. Can you write the other two that kind of correlate to these different isotopes? All right, that is just as common as the first way that I taught. All right, so you want to know both. Secondly, um, when it comes to the isotopes, all three of these, let me give you a couple things to write down. All three of these act the same in chemical reactions. That's actually why we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about them in this course. Really, this is the most we'll talk about isotopes. If you remember in one of my earlier videos, I talked about octane getting burned and providing the energy to move your car. I think I wrote at least the skeleton of a chemical reaction that was CAH18. It doesn't matter which type of carbon was in any one of those octane molecules. It may have been this type, it may have been that type, it may have been that type. They all act the same when it comes to breaking bonds and forming new bonds. In terms of radioactivity, radioactive decay, and that kind of thing, they're different. That's a little bit of a different story. C14 is actually um, undergoes radioactive decay. But that's not the focus of our course. Our course, Chem 101, is about just kind of regular chemical reactions. They will all act the same chemically. If I'm breathing CO2 or breathing out CO2, some of my CO2 that I'm breathing out, okay, this is me, breathing out CO2. Some of my CO2s will have this type, some will have this type, and believe it or not, a very small portion will have that type. Um, it doesn't really matter. The, car the carbon dioxide molecule doesn't really care which one it has. They all act the same when it comes to bonding and things like that. However, and I just hinted it at it, they are not present in like 33% him, 33%, 33% him. It's not like that. For instance, in my pencil graphite, which is really um, just carbon atoms at the tip of my pencil, that's all carbon. It's not like it's 33% him, 33% him, 33% him. There is what we call natural abundance. Okay, so natural abundance is the number, let me go ahead and um, write what it is up here, and then I'll write the numbers below. Natural abundance. Okay, natural abundance is the relative amount, AMT for amount, of each different isotope. In a naturally occurring sample. So something like my pencil graphite, that's a naturally occurring sample. That, no one had to work really hard to isolate that. Um, what is the natural abundance for each of these types? Let me go ahead and give you that natural abundances for each type. I'm going to give you this, and then we're going to do something with the numbers. The natural abundance of C12 is 98.9%. Uh, what that means, if I have a natural sample of carbon, almost 99% of them are this form. This is the most common form by far. Okay, So that's the most prevalent form of carbon that appears in nature in a carbon sample. The natural abundance of C13 is 1.1%. So about one in every 100 atoms 
if I could see them, which I can't, but if I could, if I could see them, one in a hundred of those has an extra neutron, a little heavier. If you notice, those two numbers already add up to 100, which means that C14 only exists in what we call trace or negligible amounts. It's just so, um, so little. It's there, actually. It is there. So little that we wouldn't even have to worry about it mathematically. This one is very, very rare. Okay, so really it's 99% this kind and about 1% that kind. Now, that's the prevalence. Now we have enough information to really just do one more thing with this and then we're gonna, um, we're going to finish this out here. Once you see these numbers, and I, I don't, I don't want to skip over this because now you have all the numbers in your notebook and now we can do this math right away and be done with it here. Once you see these numbers, we're going to do one calculation and I hope you'll appreciate what we're doing here. At least what I'm saying is appreciate the significance of it. Go on your periodic table and find carbon again. So you're going to find carbon number six and you see that, remember that number underneath there, what it was called. It was called the atomic mass. Okay, now that we have a little bit more information about isotopes. Let me revisit that definition just a little bit. The atomic mass, I think I told you it was the mass of an average or a typical carbon atom. Let me refine that a little bit. The atomic mass is the weighted average, weighted average of the, um, of all the isotopes of an element and they are weighted according to their natural abundance or their prevalence. I'm spelling that wrong probably, but when you have a weighted average, you give more weight to the one that's the most prevalent. This guy is going to get the most weight because he's the most prevalent. And this guy will get a little bit of weight, and this guy will get no weight because he, he's not prevalent enough to, to matter. So atomic mass is really a weighted average because this one weighs 12 AMUs, about. It's slightly, very ever so slightly Actually, this one does weigh 12 AMUs. This one is just a little off 13, but barely enough to count. This one weighs about 13 AMUs. This one weighs about 14 AMUs. But if you're talking about the average carbon atom, you have to consider the fact that they're not, you have different types that are going into that typical carbon atom. And that's what average, the atomic mass is. Now, let me just show you how to calculate it, and then we're done. This will take three more minutes, and then we will be done with this video here. So. Calculating atomic mass. This is something that you will have to do on exams. Um, let me show you how it's calculated. Calculating atomic mass. It's actually pretty easy. Okay, so let's do the atomic mass of carbon since we have the numbers already on our board. So it's just an equation. The atomic mass of, for instance, carbon. Um, I usually think about it as um, you're going to add, in this case, two numbers together. Because the first number is going to be the number that you get for the first isotope, this one. And the second number is going to be for the second isotope. Now, there is a third isotope with carbon-14, but it's if it's a present in negligible amounts, we discard it. We throw it away. It's not going to affect our weighted average. It's like it doesn't matter, okay? So if you're on doing practice questions and you have one that has three isotopes with real numbers, then you would have a third. And you could actually, some of them, you could have a fourth. So as you're doing practice questions, it's not always two numbers. It's just however many isotopes you have that have a real um, atomic, real relative abundance. So to get the, this number here, the, the number that goes into his part of the atomic mass, what you're going to do is you're going to understand that 98.9%, that means 98.9 per 100. 90, 
if you're a percentage, if you're doing a percentage, you're doing a, um, you're dividing by 100. So you, what you want to do is 98.9 divided by 100, or understand that that really just means move the decimal place two in, and you're going to turn that into a real number. A percent is not really a real number, it's a percent. You need a real number, 0.989. So you're going to take his, to get his contribution, you're going to do his natural abundance, 0.989. And you're going to times that by how much he weighs. Now, unless you're getting like real accurate data from a mass spectrometer, which they may give you on some of the practice questions on the test, just assume that if it's uh, atomic, uh, if it's a mass number of 12, just use 12 AMUs. That's fine. Um, it might be a very more refined number, like a perfect number with a bunch of decimal places because at the end of the day you can measure these things like perfectly on a machine, on a mass spectrometer. But if they don't give you that, just assume that it's 12 AMUs, how much he weighs. That will be the contribution of the first isotope. So let's go ahead and get that number. So 0.989 times how much he actually weighs, which is 12. And that gets me 11.868 AMUs. And to that, I'm going to add the contribution to the weighted average of the second isotope. So once again, 1.1%, but move the decimal place over two spots because you're dividing it by 100 if it's a percentage. So that's 0 0.011 times his mass, which if, unless we're given a very specific number, you can just assume that it would weigh 13 AMUs. Because remember, each proton and neutron weighs about one. So this would weigh about 13 AMUs. And it's close enough for this type of question here. Um, unless you're actually, if you're given the actual mass, use the actual mass. You'll see as you're doing your reading and your practice questions, they do do that sometimes. Um, okay, so 0 0.011 times 13 is zero. 0.143 AMUs. Notice I'm keeping the unit because it doesn't cancel. So it doesn't, it's not like it goes away. You just um, keep it in there. Now you add these two numbers together. Let me clear this up a little bit so you can see what we're doing here. You add those two numbers together. Oops. 11.868. And I'm getting 12.011 AMUs. And hopefully, you'll have some satisfaction that that is the number that is reported um, for the atomic mass of carbon. So what I'm trying, we do this at least once, if not other times, to make sure you understand that this is not a random number, okay? It's not like, or it's not like it came out of some machine or something. It is the average mass of a carbon atom when you consider that this one is 99% of them and this one is 1% of them. See how it bumps it up a little bit over 12. And um, I know we got 12.011. Our periodic table rounds to two decimal places for carbon. If you go to another one online and it gives you three decimal places, you will see that number. So that's what the atomic mass is. And being able to run through the numbers, at least for one atom, does kind of complete the picture. With that, we are going to be done with this lecture because we've gone fairly long, but important stuff, foundational stuff. So thank you for your attention. Hope you have a good rest of your day. and We'll be back with more information soon.